Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design the Ducks podcast. Our guest today is Balvir Nandra. Welcome, Balvir. Good morning. Welcome. Fantastic to have you here. Tell us about you and your work. Um, I have been a practicing designer for well over 40 years now. Uh, I graduated uh, in 76 at Ravensbourne in, in Kent. You've had two of my very good friends on your podcast before, John Spencer and uh, Professor Phil Cleaver. Uh, we're constantly in touch and we're very much engaged in what's happening uh, since we've been practicing. Uh, my own career spans uh, working in, across the board for major companies. I worked for IBM, I worked for Honeywell. Uh, I've done work for the manufacturing side of the industry, also uh, design consultancies. And then I set up my own business, uh, which was a publishing business, um, servicing clients like Haymarket uh, and various magazines as production bits. And then I moved into teaching, uh, which was by default, really, in the sense that uh, I'd moved to Birmingham to set up a sister company uh, handling exhibition work. Uh, and that's when the 1987 recession came. And um, I decided to stay in Birmingham. I'd moved from, from London, lock, stock and barrel. Um, and I decided to stay on. The uh, local college, which was then Birmingham Polytechnic, offered me a job. Uh, so just doing some, some part-time teaching. Because I'd done that before at my old college and also at Central School of Art with Anthony Frashog, who was my mentor and, and teacher many years ago. Um, and the rest, as I say, is history. I kind of went in part-time and then got involved full-time and um, started balancing uh, professional work with teaching work. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've loved both of them. Uh, and I, I, I've taught for over 30 years. I'm kind of technically retired in a sense, but I never have in, in the sense I'm still teaching. I'm still involved with uh, quite a few institutes across the world. Uh, so what you're trying to do is of great interest to me. Um, and um, I, I just had to get involved in this somehow. Um, education is at a crossroads at the moment, I believe. And uh, especially with COVID-19 now, there are um, issues that have been accelerated in, in some ways. Uh, there are people who, who perhaps uh, universities are notorious for for being like uh, huge ships. If you turn a ship around, it takes a few miles before you can do it. You know, at the speed at which that they move um, has been accelerated now. So we're at a, we're at a very interesting kind of, kind of phase. Mm -hmm. So that's roughly where I'm from. Fantastic. Fantastic. Tell us about the latest projects you're working on. Um, currently, I'm working with the School of Architecture at Nottingham Trent University. Uh, and my role there is to actually look at integrated design studies. Uh, and that means how architecture connects to other industries, other professions in terms of design and the historical context, um, right on from, uh, if you like, uh, the, the, the history of architecture from Vitruvius all the way down to where we are now. We're looking at uh, the Enlightenment, how the Industrial Revolution came around, and, and, and the connections that have been made in terms of materiality, in terms of philosophy from Hegel to Marx, uh, how economics have actually aided and abetted the changes that uh, we've been through. Um, and the response, I've been doing that for the last kind of three years with my son, who is also, he's very much a, a philosophical expert. Uh, so between the two of us, we've been working uh, with students um, uh, at graduate level, and he's been working at postgraduate level as well. Um, it's been a very, very interesting shared experience. Uh, lots of sort of demonstrations of, of practice, uh, how, for example, I, I'm a graphic designer, but I'm also a typographer, a uh, bit of a history. There isn't anything in, in terms of visual communication, if you like, that I haven't really touched at some point or the other. 
So um, they're very receptive. They've they've had some very good reports uh, from the, the point of view of content and point of view of context. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm writing currently a, a paper on on uh, the um, state of architectural education, uh, which seems to be at a, at a very kind of uh, how can I put this technological um, crossroads. Mm-hmm. You know, how do people visualize buildings? Uh, why are we making the kind of buildings that we are? Uh, everybody talks about sustainability, for example. And what really is sustainability? Uh, it's that, That's what I'm involved in. And I'm also involved in a film school in India. Um, there's never a, a, a time when I sort of sit still. <laughs> and I also paint for pleasure. I, it's, uh, it's something I've done for for a long time. Uh, I have very firm views about art and design as being two very distinct separate things. Mm-hmm. Design is not art, and art is not design. Art for me is personal expression. It's about personal mm-hmm. experience. Design for me is a means to an end. It's 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 for a specific purpose. It's um, the way we make our lives a bit better. Uh, that's the way I see it. Um, so that's where I'm at the moment. Fantastic. Is, is that an online program that you, that you're helping sort of, because you mentioned. Uh, yes. I've been working with uh, the open universities online program for a number of years. Mm. And uh, currently uh, I'm working with Coventry university mm. in the UK. Again, it's Coventry online, Coventry university online. They set up a, a, a standalone unit a couple of years ago. Uh, and have managed to reach number six uh, ranking in the world. And uh, for me, it's, it's quite luckily, it's one of my ex-students who's actually heading that. So I have this sort of the inside track on that to some extent. Um, the courses there are very specific, they're short courses. There are um, very specific kind of courses they are actually setting up. But the key thing is they're run by academics in terms of the content in terms of what needs to be taught, what needs to be learned, rather than somebody coming in as a course learning designer and um, uh, effectively dismissing the, the essential elements of content, of context. You know, what is the subject about? What does the subject do? Um, uh, when I plan this, this, this kind of chat today, I talked about Fiction, uh, faction, and reality. Fiction for me is some of the promises that the universities have always made to students. And a lot of these um, people like myself don't look at the notion of what students want or what, what their needs might be. Um, there's a fantastic quote from Cicero. And he said, the authority of those who teach is often an obstacle to those who want to learn. And uh, I've always held that close to my heart in, in terms of remembering that I may be a teacher, but I could be an obstacle to the way people learn mm-hmm. and their expectations in terms of their interests, uh, some of the awkward questions they might ask. Uh, and, and that's always kind of driven me. Um, and the second thing that's driven me was a meeting I had with um, very, very famous product designer. Um, I, his name escapes me right now. It's, um, uh, he, he wrote a famous book, Design for the Real World, Victor Papanek. Um, I met him in 1975 uh, at the Royal College function. And I was in my second year then, and we had a brief chat. And he has forever inspired me in terms of my approach to what design is and what design is capable of. Uh, and then that also alludes to people like uh, Schumacher, um, you know, small is beautiful. Uh, I see design as something that improves the life of the general person in some positive way. Uh, that also then means that I am not a consumerist per se. My, uh, I'm, I'm not interested in shifting get toothpaste or whatever it may be 
You know, I, I know somebody who's been doing that for the last 20 years, mm. working on one product, which is fine if that is what you want to do. Uh, and I think certainly we're at a crossroads in, in terms of where we're going, how we're treating the earth, the world. And this pandemic has raised some very key issues. And I believe that um, I'm in the right position in some ways to make some difference to newer people, newer students. It's not the youngsters to blame. It's us who've been driving the, the business side of it. And we've gone where the money is, which is natural human tendency. But I think we also, to some extent, bypassed our own responsibilities as designers. Um, sounds very altruistic, it's not. I think for me, it's a matter of uh, good design actually cannot be stopped. You know, it, it's, it's there, but it does need a certain kind of frame of mind. And my advice to students would be, if you want to get into design to make money, you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> of course. Get of course. into design to do good design. And the rest of the reward will follow. They of don't course. believe it very often. Of course. But then it happens. <laughs> of course. We'll get, we'll get to that. Uh, so tell us a story about how you got into teaching. Um, I got into teaching purely as sort of busman's holiday. I used to work in central London and I had a, a production uh, unit in Chiswick. And um, I kept in touch with my old college through various research projects. I'm very interested in typography and non-Roman typography in particular. I, I designed non-Roman type. And um, through that, uh, I'd also met Anthony Farshock, who was arguably one of the greatest type designers that this country ever produced. And he had invited me to teach alongside him at uh, the Central School of Art and Design in those days. They, it wasn't Central St. Martin's, it was yes. standalone Central. So I used to do sort of bits and bobs with him, and I did some sessions also at Ravenspawn, my old college. Uh, and it, it, it was just fun. It was just sharing professional experience. It was sharing dialogues, getting involved in kind of debates, that kind of thing. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to Birmingham to set up a production company to service the exhibition industry at the NEC um, that I sort of really got involved in teaching. Uh, I looked around, went to a local sort of art school, and Birmingham Art School of Art was, I hadn't realized it at the time, it was the only school set up as a specific art school. Uh, its buildings have a covenant on them. That building cannot be used for anything other than teaching of art. It, it was um, a, a, a fantastic thing. Anyway, they asked me to do some typographic stuff. Uh, they were interested in bolstering up their type design uh, and typography in general. Uh, so I started working with, with um, all across the uh, undergraduate kind of program, uh, anything from type measurement to how type is used, what type, the power of type, all that kind of thing, reading, et cetera. And I did that a couple of days a week. Um, and that kind of transformed into a, a, a bigger opportunity. Somebody had left and they asked me to apply for that job. I said, well, would you be interested in, in doing this full time? You can still have time for your, uh, you know, you can have a research day, a couple of days where you can continue with your business interests. And to me, that was um, a, a no brainer. I was enjoying teaching. I've always enjoyed that. Uh, it also gave me the opportunity to continue working on, uh, on my professional stuff. So um, that's what I did. And um, uh, kind of 30 years later, I'm still doing, the, the, that recipe is still continuing. You know, I haven't stopped working professionally. Uh, I, I take on commissions as and when uh, I feel they're right for me. So I've been very lucky. And, and I must emphasize that. A lot of this is to, to do with being at the right place at the right time very often. Uh, but uh, opportunities have to be grabbed. You, you, you can't sort of uh, uh, go half-hearted at something. So that, that, that's how I got into teaching. And uh, I, I've, I haven't looked back since. Fantastic, fantastic. So if, if uh, you could do uh, anything you like in, in education, what would you change or, or remove or keep or maintain? Or what would you change? I think 
if I've, I've written whole courses, I've written BA courses, I've written MA courses, I've been through serious uh, peer validations, all that kind of thing. My the thing I would change perhaps is um, if you look at the current system, there's an over reliance on on uh, the use of computers as tools. And this is something that people uh, tend to forget. The computer is not doing your thinking for you. You know, I, I, I learned to code with IBM many years ago. Uh, I, I did all the old codes, Fortran, COBOL, et cetera, et cetera. If you go down that route, then you were actually catching up every day. You're never at the top end of that, unless you're in Silicon Valley, I presume. So there's a question of what does a piece of software do as opposed to what does your own mind do? And I would um, very strongly uh, restructure here uh, the, the first year of any course, any design course, to do more with the contextual history of design and how it's come about, how things started to be manufactured and why some of those processes were necessary and how they worked. There's also the question of the social history of design. And there's a question of if there is a need for something. Design for need, for me, is, is the key thing. Uh, and again, when it comes to type, language is a key thing, certainly in, in graphic design. Uh, if you don't understand the meaning of something, the meaning of, of, of language, I think you're at a disadvantage. And I think what's happening is a lot of schools now simply put kids in front of uh, a computer program, or they'll, they'll say Adobe Suite, you know, sort of a, that's the default position. They all come out doing collages, you know, personal bits and pieces, and, and they think they are designers. Uh, so there's very little design context or thinking um, taught to them in, in, in that sense. We've now got rid of foundation courses where the people used to get the opportunity of, of, of materiality, uh, learning to weld, learning to work with wood, metal, whatever, glass. Uh, so you had a more holistic approach to problem solving. And I think if we claim to be problem solvers, then we must also understand what problem society needs us to solve. And I would emphasize very much, you know, you asked about, about the change. I think the first year should be a much broader approach to uh, to how design fits in with who we are as human beings. Uh, I think that is important. And a lot of that is to do with reading. A lot of that is to do with philosophy. Uh, I, I'm not getting sort of, uh, I'm not saying it becomes a philosophical course, but I think any course, any good studies underpinned with sound philosophy. You know, architecture is a classic example of that. Um, so I would do that, and then perhaps, you know, there's, there's no question of how much time should somebody spend doing a course or studying a course. And my argument on that one was you can actually teach a good design course in two years full time, or you could do it in three years. That's okay. But the doing, the making, the application of what your thinking is happens predominantly in the second year and the third year and you progressively become more independent. I'm not one for art directing students to win competitions like the DNAD or whatever it may be. Uh, and a lot of colleges actually rely on that for public profiles because they're now a business. So education has been uh, turned into a commodity. Uh, and when you turn something into a commodity, you naturally get the profit motive. And I think that's, that's um, Maybe the horse has bolted on that one. Um, I don't think it has. I think uh, when I talk to younger people, younger students, and I talk to a lot of them, um, they're thinking there's a sea change uh, going on now. Uh, a lot of students are now thinking, why would I spend 9,000 pounds to go to a British university for a year? And what am I going to get for that at the end of that? You spent 36,000, 50,000 pounds with your uh, yeah. sort of outlay. Uh, where are the jobs? Uh, are they guaranteed? This is the promises. You know, when I talk about fiction, 
the fiction of recruitment, I've done a lot of recruitment myself on, on at trade fairs and British Council fairs and all sorts. Uh, the promise always is, you can do what you can, uh, what would you like to. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, way of earning a living. Uh, a lot of that is true. But the hidden part of it, which is how many rocket scientists do you need? You know, how many typographers do you need? How many typefaces do you need redesigned? Uh, all of that uh, is is something that most educational institutes do not talk about. Mm. Uh, and we kind of give them faction. It's fiction to get them in. It's faction. Look, this is great. You work hard. You, you get a great job. The problem is uh, we no longer have paid internships, very few paid internships. So I've had a lot of my students go out, very talented people go out, They've done um, internships with very, very good companies in household names, uh, agencies, uh, on the promise of, of uh, if you do well enough, there's potentially a job here. And then kind of six months down the line, they kind of told, well, you know, not really. We haven't really got much. Because there's this constant flow of people coming through from, from art schools. We're overproducing, yeah. if you like, to some extent. And we're all producing a, 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 if you like, I, I, I hate to use the word, a product, if you like. And that product is somebody who's very keen, very bright, um, wants to do something for themselves. I'm, I'm using this as, as a, you know, the student as a product here. And then we let them down at the very end where we simply say, actually, you know, um, life isn't as, as easy as you, you, you think it might be. Uh, you only have to look at the current situation. Um, statistically now, uh, it's pretty much 71% of UK design companies don't know whether they'll still be in existence in 2021. 35% of all design work by a lot of agencies in the last three months has quite literally disappeared. Uh, that has happened not because design is a bad profession to be in. It's happened through social conditions, through some of the effects of what we've done, through some of the ways we've treated the earth, the way we've treated our resources. So uh, my approach is uh, that you have to look at this holistically and see our part in it. Um, I'm still in design because I believe in it. You know, when Victor Papanek talked about design, uh, I, I remind myself every day uh, about the fact that somewhere in a science system or somewhere in, in a talk or a, a conversation with a student, I, I've, I've helped them to see something new. Um, that to me is important. And um, I don't believe in teaching as a course profession. Um, Aristotle never took any money for teaching anybody. He simply said, if you want to learn, come and listen to me but I will not be paid for what I do. Uh, it sounds many you know, thousands of years ago, but the point is that approach is still very much what teaching should be about, uh, in, in, my, in my opinion. Um, my approach always has been that any student that I've taught should be better than me at at least one thing that I know, whether it is the gift of the gap, whether it is a process, whether it is a technology, if they can't beat me at something by the time they've left me, then I've failed them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you look at some of the current stuff that's going on, um, it's still possible to exercise that kind of, uh, that kind of belief, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I've rattled on a bit. No, not at all, not at all. I mean, you've touched upon the, the next question about em employment yes. and how can we help students enter design. You've, you've touched upon this little bit, but we can sort of... Yeah. Uh, I think um, the model of education that I would encourage is where, when we talk about design, one has to talk about it in a holistic way. In other words, it's not just graphic design mm -hmm. or advertising or a, an aspect of design, whereas you know, visual communication is a huge field. 
But one of the advantages of visual communication is that it transcends other disciplines. Yes. It touches on other disciplines. You go and look at a cathedral in Sindoni or wherever it is. You go and look at um, Sofia Hadia, wherever, you know, piece of, where do you go when you go to a new city? You go to its museum, you go to its cultural places. And it's that aspect of culture, which to some extent is missing in, in how we teach and what we teach. Uh, and it's, it's impact. Uh, to the students, I would say, it's about the kind of world you want to create. Um, my generation, perhaps to a very large extent, failed them. Um, failed them in the sense that we've made design into a service. And if we are a service, that's okay. But I think design is more than that. And if it is not a service, then we need to really reposition ourselves as uh, the bringers of something to the table that is more than merely a process, i.e. using a piece of software well, uh, doing a task well. It's about thinking. It is our, our inner belief. It is about personhood. What is, who are we? And I suppose on that note, the example I would give is to students is, please, if you can, I would encourage anyone to do this, is to look at the work of Yaron Lanier. Uh, he was Google's chief scientist. This is the man who invented the phrase virtual reality. And he's currently working with Microsoft, but look up Yaron Lanier. He's written several books, the first one being You Are Not a Gadget. Now, this is a computer scientist, computer philosopher, telling people, uh, you know, he, he's a guy who's instrumental in the world that we live in now. And he's now become something of a rebel for very good reasons. Mm. And if they read some of his works, and I think his works are critically important to anybody studying on any design course today. Uh, I would put that on a required reading list. Um, and that then points us to the future of what we what can be. Um, so to any student, I would say, learn from the past. Here's something else that Cicero said many years ago. If you do not have an appreciation for your history, then how do you create a future? If you don't know your past, and, and you're not aware of the present, how are you going to fashion a future? So that's, that would be my, my advice. Fantastic, fantastic. Any uh, last remarks, any last comments? Um, my last remarks would be, don't lose a positive streak. Uh, we call ourselves problem solvers, fine. This is the time when the world needs us to solve problems. There are political problems, there are uh, problems to do with uh, merely earning a living, uh, merely being human beings. Uh, it's the biggest challenge any potential designers ever faced. Now is the time to be in the kitchen because the heat is really on. So my, my advice to anybody now would be, don't shy away from the challenge that we have. And I sincerely, honestly believe that the field of design that we're in, in various, you know, from, from any form of design, from product design to, to visual communication to whatever form of design it may be, you know, anything at all, that the collaboration we now need as human beings will decide our future as, as a, not just civilizations, as a species. Mm -hmm. So it's time to stand up and be counted. That's what I would say. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. That's Thank okay. You. No, Thank, not you. At all. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, okay. it's, it's been really nice. I've had a chance to sort of rant a little bit. I'm a bit like that. That's wonderful. Um, but thank you very much indeed. It's a real pleasure. Take good care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.